In the last few years of the 19th century, British dominion in southern Africa was for the first time seriously challenged. Friction, distrust, and political rivalry between the Boer republics of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State and the British dominions of Natal and the Cape had pushed the region almost to the brink of war. In 1852, the Dutch-speaking peoples of the Transvaal had been granted limited rights of self-government by Britain, then the paramount imperial power in the region. Two years later, Similar rights were granted to the Orange River Territory. Behind these concessions lay a calculated disregard for what the British believed to be an arid, inhospitable and generally barren hinterland. This perception encouraged a belief that the Boer Republics would remain financially dependent on the comparatively richer coastal territories and militarily in awe of Britain. For most of the remaining years of the 19th century, this situation did indeed prevail. The coastal ports grew and prospered. Diamond mining in the Northern Cape threw up the town of Kimberley and brought an influx of migrant workers to the region. Railways were built and further settlements established. Economic development filtered northwards from the Cape ports along the railway lines to the interior. The Orange Free State, as it had now become, grew modestly, maintaining close economic ties with the Cape. To its north, the Transvaal pursued its own perilous and impoverished course. Both republics shared a sloping and often mountainous plateau that ran from the Drakensberg and the great eastern escarpment of the Transvaal to the wide and empty expanses of the Western Cape. Both republics were agriculturally poor and hence sparsely populated. But these problems were exacerbated in the Transvaal by its isolation and by its proximity to the warlike and hostile African nations of the interior. For nearly two centuries, the British had lived in comparative harmony with these nations, according them political recognition and some measure of autonomy in the administration of their own affairs. Yet by 1877, relations between these nations and the Transvaal had become so fraught that the British High Commissioner in Cape Town, Sir Bartle Freer, was compelled to intervene by annexing the Transvaal and by sending troops into Zululand. The military conquest of the Zulus and the subsequent incorporation of their lands within the territory of Natal brought a brief period of peace to the region. The peace lasted only until December 1880, when Paul Kruger led a rebellion of Transvaal Boers, inflicting defeats on the British at the battles of Lang's Neck, Mount Prospect and Majuba Hill. Although not militarily decisive, these reverses dissuaded Britain from any further involvement in the affairs of the Transvaal. By the Convention of Pretoria in 1881, 
the British Prime Minister, William Gladstone, consented to an arrangement restoring self-government to the Transvaal, while reserving some nominal rights of supervision to Britain. In 1883, Kruger was elected president, and the Republic once again reverted to its preferred path of isolation and self-sufficiency. There, the story might have ended. But in 1886, there occurred an event which was to change Britain's attitude to the Transvaal profoundly. Gold was discovered in an area known by the Boers as the Ridge of White Water, or the Witwatersrand. Gold working had been going on in the Transvaal for some years, but this had been concentrated on alluvial deposits in the west of the country. On the Witwatersrand, the prospectors encountered a reef of gold-bearing quartz some 30 miles in length. Gold production skyrocketed. In 1886, production accounted for less than 0.2% of world output and virtually all the Transvaal's foreign earnings. In 1887, production trebled, still accounting for less than 1% of world output. But in the following year, gold production rose an astonishing tenfold. And by 1893, the Transvaal was producing almost a fifth of the world's gold. By 1898, the gold fields of the Transvaal had overtaken America as the world's single largest gold producer, accounting for an incredible 30% of total world output. Immense wealth flooded the Transvaal. The town of Johannesburg sprang up in the shadow of the Rand. International finance followed quickly on the heels of the early prospectors, transforming the diggings into a major industry. Prosperity and capital investment in mine workings and machinery brought in their turn even greater levels of immigration. Johannesburg teemed with the new arrivals. Mine workers and laborers from the Cape, engineers from Europe and America, entrepreneurs and fortune hunters from all over the world. Such an influx, however, threatened the traditional dominance of the native Dutch-speaking population and there were other ramifications. In the space of a dozen years, the Transvaal had been elevated from one of the poorest to one of the richest countries in the world. Inexorably, and contrary to all Britain's designs, economic power began to shift, not only within Southern Africa, but within the world at large, towards the seemingly inexhaustible gold-bearing reefs of the Rand. In 1895, an abortive attempt to topple Kruger's government was mounted by Dr. Leander Starr Jemison. The Jemison raid, as it became known, ended in fiasco. Jemison's force of some 500 colonial volunteers was intercepted and rounded up as it advanced through the Western Transvaal towards Johannesburg. The raid only further exacerbated the already strained relations between Britain and the Transvaal. For behind Jemison lay the burgeoning ambitions of Cecil Rhodes. Rhodes had been the driving force behind the development of Kimberley. In 1890, he had been elected Prime Minister of the Cape and had combined this office with his considerable financial interests both in Kimberley and in the Rand. More ominously, Rhodes and Jemison had been encouraged in their enterprise by Britain's colonial secretary, Joseph Chamberlain. The raid also exacerbated relations between Kruger's government and those who he termed the Outlanders, or outsiders. They were the white, mainly English-speaking immigrants. Regarding them only as a necessary evil, Kruger refused to give them any form of political representation and burdened them with discriminatory taxes. In 
To Chamberlain, the treatment of the Uitlanders was only part of the problem he faced in the region. Since 1873, international trade, increasingly based on gold as the principal standard of monetary exchange, had grown dramatically. And at the center of this busy international system of commerce and finance, underpinned by the gold fields of the Rand, was the city of London. For Chamberlain, the reintegration of the Transvaal within a British-dominated Union of South Africa had become a pressing necessity. The man Chamberlain chose to engineer this union was Alfred Milner. As High Commissioner for Southern Africa, Milner had a claim, under the terms of the agreements of 1881, to some vaguely defined authority over the Transvaal's affairs. Milner used this authority to institute a subtle campaign of coercion, designed to bully the Transvaal into either submitting to Chamberlain's designs for the region, or breaking completely, thus precipitating a war. Kruger, however, proved a wily opponent. Numerous evasive and insubstantial compromises were floated, while the state revenues were increasingly diverted to the purchase of arms and ammunition. A military alliance was concluded with the Orange Free State, and Kruger took every opportunity to fate the Free State president, Martinus Stein. Stein, however, believed that war could yet be avoided, and in June 1899, he hosted a conference between Kruger and Milner in the free state capital of Bloemfontein. Distrust and intransigence on both sides contributed to the failure of this last attempt to achieve a negotiated settlement, and its collapse after four days ensured that war became inevitable. A campaign vilifying Kruger was mounted in the British press. The grievances of the Uitlander community were highlighted and the conflict was presented as one between an ignorant, greedy and pernicious state and the legitimate rights of the Uitlanders championed by Britain. The press campaign was reinforced by military preparations and by intimidating political and diplomatic developments. In mid-September, 10,000 troops were embarked for South Africa. A few days later, General Penn Simons, commanding the Natal garrison, advanced troops to Dundee, a frontier town situated within rapid striking distance of both the Free State and the Transvaal. The effect was immediate. Kruger ordered a general mobilization of the Transvaal. Five days later, the Free State mobilized. In Johannesburg, there was panic. Rumors of the imminent arrest or expulsion of the British Uitlander community precipitated a general exodus towards the comparative safety of the British colonies and the coast. An ultimatum was delivered to the British by Frank Wrights, the Transvaal State Secretary. The ultimatum, drafted by Kruger's Attorney General, Jan Smuts, demanded the immediate withdrawal of all British forces and the recall of all forces in transit or at sea. The expiry of the ultimatum and the declaration of war on October the 11th found the British as yet unprepared for a major conflict. The government ordered the mobilization of reserves and the early embarkation of an army corps. The first troop ships left for South Africa within a few days, carrying the nucleus of what would grow to become the largest army Britain had ever sent overseas. In South Africa, the Boer offensive was launched quickly and on a broad front. In the west, large forces advanced towards Kimberley and Mafeking. In the south, free state commandos invaded the populous districts of the Southern Cape. But the principal weight of the offensive fell not on the Cape, but on Natal, where Penn Simons had rashly committed the bulk of the available British forces in the region to the defense of Ladysmith and Dundee. 
first engagements between these two forces were marked by high casualties and some confusion on both sides. At Talana Hill, outside Dundee, the Boers were checked and then driven back. But amongst the casualties was Penn Simons, mortally wounded in the fighting. The British now found themselves in danger of gradual encirclement by growing numbers of Boers. The new commander-in-chief of Britain's forces in southern Africa was General Sir George White. White had landed in Durban on October the 7th. He had sanctioned Simon's stand at Dundee and then set about reinforcing the garrison at Ladysmith. Now White ordered the remnants of Simon's force to retreat to Ladysmith, where he intended to make a second stand with a combined force of 13,000 troops. White planned to engage the enemy by striking out towards their main force in strength. Intelligence reports placed this force some four miles to the north of Ladysmith. On October the 30th, the British advanced into the hills to the east of Ladysmith, intending to swing around the left flank of the Boer positions. But the attack floundered into empty space. During the night, the Boers had shifted their positions, outflanking the British. The disaster cost White 1,300 casualties and sent his forces reeling back into Ladysmith in disorder and confusion. Three days later, the rail and telegraph links to the town were cut. The war can be seen clearly as having two distinct phases. The first phase covers the period of conventional warfare and the attempts to relieve the Ladysmith garrison and to relieve the towns of Kimberley and Mafeking. These towns had been invested within a few days of the outbreak of war and confirmed the Boer strategy of seizing control of the rail links in the region. But the Boers also had other reasons for investing these towns. Kimberley was the largest and richest town in the Cape, other than Cape Town itself, and its ownership had been a matter of some dispute between the Orange Free State and Britain. Another great attraction for the Boers was Cecil Rhodes. Their old enemy had been locked up in Kimberley with the garrison of four and a half thousand Cape volunteers. The Boers had never forgiven Rhodes for his part in the Jemison raid and regarded him as the embodiment of Britain's imperial ambitions in the region. The capture of Rhodes would be a political coup, damaging British morale and settling some old scores. The investment of Kimberley was marked in the early stages by intermittent skirmishes and artillery duels, and in the latter by food shortages, though these were mostly borne by the native population. For the white South Africans locked up in Kimberley, the principal discomfort lay in the substitution of horse flesh for beef. But for natives, rationing was strict. Scurvy and malnutrition were endemic, and infant mortality soared to an appalling 93.5%. At Mafeking, the privations were, if anything, worse, and the siege harsher and more enduring. Colonel Robert Baden-Powell commanded a garrison of about a thousand men. This force had been hastily assembled and stationed in Mafeking to pose an ostensible threat to the Transvaal's northwestern frontier. The rationale behind the plan was to distract the Transvaal and draw a substantial part of her military strength away from the vulnerable southern Cape. Mafeking was of dubious strategic value to either side. The northern cape was arid and sparsely populated. The town itself was little more than a railway siding, lying 250 miles to the north of Kimberley. The severing of the rail and telegraph systems at Kimberley 
effectively isolated Mafeking, rendering its investment largely meaningless. The small force commanded by Baden-Powell was incapable of mounting a significant attack on the Transvaal. But the mere threat succeeded in its aim of tying down significant Boer forces at a critical time in the conflict. The siege was to last for seven months. Intermittent and sometimes heavy shelling and a pattern of small but deadly engagements contrasted strangely with Baden-Powell's efforts to maintain morale. A siege newspaper was published, concerts and theatrical productions were staged, and the trivial paraphernalia of daily life were given peculiar emphasis. During the siege, the antics of Baden-Powell and the stoical, determinedly ordinary behavior of many of its inhabitants turned Mafeking into a symbol of national resolve. assured the eccentric Baden-Powell of an immortality as enduring as any of his peers. There was no similarly sentimental affection for the situation at Ladysmith. There, 12,000 of Her Majesty's finest soldiers were locked up in a squalid, sweltering and sordid little sideshow, the laughing stock of the world. The man selected to redeem this situation was General Sir Redvers Buller. Buller was one of the most respected and experienced soldiers in the British Army. He had served extensively throughout the Empire. In Africa, Buller had served under Field Marshal Wolseley in the Ashanti War and in the Kaffir and Zulu Wars. When Wolseley became Commander-in-Chief of the British Army in 1895, Buller as his protégé and ally, rose accordingly, taking command at Aldershot and emerging as the heir apparent to the supreme military office in the British Empire. In southern Africa, however, Buller was confronted with a difficult dilemma. His original plan had been to assemble his forces in the Cape and advance across the Orange River to Bloemfontein and thence to Johannesburg and Pretoria. But this would mean the sacrifice of White's not inconsiderable force at Ladysmith, a grave blow to Britain's international prestige and to British morale. Buller had also warned White not to advance beyond the Tugela River, and it was to redeem this blunder that Buller himself was compelled to abandon his earlier plan and advance through Natal to the formidable natural fastnesses on the Tugela's northern bank. Buller's army, although numerically superior to the Boer forces arrayed against it, faced a variety of handicaps. In southern Africa, December is one of the hottest months of the year. Temperatures in the shade can rise to well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Fresh water, a rare enough commodity in any season, is virtually unobtainable in the arid hinterlands of northern Natal. The army, in consequence, was effectively tethered to the railway line, linking it with Durban and the coast. As well as these constraints, Buller also faced an invigorated and radically strengthened enemy. In late November, the Transvaal Commandant General, Pete Huber, had been badly injured in a fall from his horse. Huber was taken back to Pretoria and his place in the field was taken by Louis Bota. Bota had emerged as a brilliant and dynamic leader in the very first weeks of the war and Huber's injury now enabled him to set a trap for Buller, fortifying the Tugela on either side of the railway bridge and crossings just outside the town of Colenso. Buller's first attempt to force the Tugela at the very center of Bota's defensive cordon was to be merely the third in a series of disasters that befell the British in what became known as Black Week. <laughs> 
Buller had given Sir William Gattaker command of the 3rd Infantry Division and instructed him to stem the incursions of the Boer commandos in the Southern Cape. Gattaker, however, had embarked on a straightforward advance and attack upon the main Boer force ensconced at Stormberg Junction. The battle lasted only a few minutes. Less than a hundred casualties were sustained on both sides, but the reports which galled Buller were not the casualty figures, but the accounts of British infantry retreating in panic and confusion, and of the 600 captives taken by the Boers. The following day, news came of an even greater disaster. The 1st Infantry Division, commanded by Lord Methuen, had been plodding doggedly along the line of the railway towards Kimberley. At Belmont, on November the 23rd, and at Graspen, two days later, Boer forces had retreated after a short skirmish. At the Battle of the Modder River, on November the 28th, Methuen sustained over 500 casualties in a frontal assault on the Boer positions. But the attack had carried, and the Boers were yet again pushed back. At Magersfontein, on December the 11th, the Boers stood firm and inflicted a shattering blow to Methuen's division. The reverse at Magersfontein cost 1st Infantry a further 1,000 casualties, and so gravely damaged its morale that Methuen was forced to withdraw to the Modder, where he remained on the defensive for three months. On December the 13th, Buller's artillery opened on the Boer positions on the Tugela. Two days later, the attack went in. By midday, the battle had all but ended. Buller had lost well over a thousand casualties and 12 field guns. Not a yard of ground had been won. The disasters of Black Week were characterized in every case by fundamental errors of strategy compounded by grave structural and tactical deficiencies deeply rooted in the British Army. At Stormberg Junction, Gattaca's advance upon the Boer positions had been marked by confusion, disorganization, and delays. No preliminary scouting preceded the actual attack, and the infantry was caught in a murderous crossfire. At Magersfontein, Methuen's infantry was caught in close formation against heavily fortified Boer entrenchments several hundred yards further forward and in a quite different position than the British had expected. Buller himself had been caught in a similar snare. The Boers had built prodigious earthworks along the crest of hills overlooking the Tugela. It was these positions that Buller's artillery had bludgeoned remorselessly for two days. But the real positions, just as formidable, were well concealed and sighted at the base of the hills, on the banks of the river. When the Boer gunfire erupted, Buller's infantry was advancing in quarter column, and his doomed guns were unlimbering and deploying well within accurate rifle range of the Boer entrenchments. To the British officer, in 1899, Quarter column and close order manoeuvres were both indispensable and reassuringly familiar, and they were effective tactics against ill-armed tribal warriors or native rebels. But they were not good tactics when advancing across open ground towards fixed entrenchments manned by men with magazine rifles and prototype machine guns. Although small by European standards, the British Army was a professional army. The men signed on for a shilling a day for a minimum of six years. Life in the army was exceptionally hard and commissions for enlisted men were virtually unheard of. 
The ranks were consequently not a place for men of ambition, means or education. And much of the British army was composed of regiments raised in Ireland or the Highland areas of Scotland, and of men for whom the army, whatever its shortcomings, promised a temporary refuge from the vicious cycle of rural destitution and urban poverty. The officers were, by contrast, drawn from the other extreme, the sons of Britain's substantial aristocracy. Furthermore, the army was principally designed for putting down native rebellions, and to most of the officers, the Boer invasion was essentially just another native rebellion. This perceived role of the army and the social gulf between officers and men was reflected in the training regimes and the prevailing tactical doctrines in the army. The emphasis was on discipline and on keeping the men in order. Little importance was attached to marksmanship and the soldiers were given only rudimentary instruction in aiming and firing. The overriding tactical doctrines which had persisted throughout the 19th century placed the emphasis on firing by volley and on close order marching advances. Much of a soldier's service was spent in endlessly drilling in these maneuvers. Yet for all that, the British infantryman in 1899 was a remarkable fellow. Rarely able to read, write, or even shoot properly, he was often capable of incredible, almost reckless courage, and of enduring hardships with a common soldier's humor and stoical resignation. The Boer army could not have been more different. It was a true citizen's army. Every man between the ages of 16 and 60 was eligible for service and required by law to provide his own horse and rifle. Since 1895, this elementary provision had been augmented by the state and at the outbreak of war, virtually all those eligible for service possessed at least one good horse and the latest German Mauser 7mm rifle. The Mauser was indisputably the best rifle in the world. It was a high-velocity, long-range rifle designed to be rapidly reloaded with clips of five smokeless powder cartridges. At a distance, the absence of smoke made the rifle fire almost invisible. At closer ranges and fired horizontally into advancing formations, the high-velocity bullets were capable of killing or wounding more than one soldier at a time. And the Boers could shoot. At a time when all military textbooks agreed on the impossibility of directing accurate rifle fire at distances greater than 800 yards, the Boers, untutored in modern military theory, demonstrated an alarmingly consistent accuracy at 1,200 yards. It was this fatal combination of entrenchments and accuracy and volume of horizontal fire that turned the strategic and tactical blunders of Black Week into disasters. Fifteen years later, the British Army would find itself on the banks of another Tugela, just as ill-prepared and just as vulnerable. And, as on the Tugela, the British infantry on the Somme would have to pay the butcher's bill. For Buller, Black Week was a personal disaster. Two days after losing his guns outside Colenso, he was replaced as Commander-in-Chief in South Africa by Field Marshal Roberts. In contrast to Buller, Roberts had spent most of his service life in the East. In 1858, 
Roberts had won the Victoria Cross as a lieutenant in the Indian Mutiny. After further distinguished service in the Second Afghan War of 1878, Roberts served as Commander-in-Chief in India and then in Ireland. At 67, Roberts knew he was approaching the end of his service career. His ultimate ambition, to succeed Wolseley as Commander-in-Chief of the Army, had for years appeared blocked by Buller's preferment as Wolseley's protégé and ally. In the battle for Colenso, Robert's rivalry with Buller had been given a further tragic twist. Among the casualties had been Robert's only son. Lieutenant Freddy Roberts had been killed in a brave but ultimately vain attempt to rescue Buller's guns. Abandoned on the vulnerable southern bank of the Tugela. Robert's appointment was to signal a new determination by Britain. The disasters of Black Week had unnerved the government and shaken public confidence in the army. The continuing investment of White at Ladysmith and of the garrisons at Kimberley and Mafeking threatened to undermine Britain's credibility in the eyes of the world. In the first months of the war, the Boers had proved themselves formidable enemies and their generals more imaginative and more daring than their British counterparts. In the absence of quality, Britain at least could always rely upon quantity and 1900 would find the full weight of the empire brought to bear on the conflict. Volunteers from Britain would be joined by volunteers from Canada, Australia and New Zealand. By the end of the war, nearly half a million British and colonial troops would see service in the region. Oh, Tante Kova, it's a quiet old babe. Rai our coffee, dan geest in jouw sneef. 
1899, the Boer republics of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State had gone to war with Britain, invading the British dominions of Natal and the Cape, and laying siege to the towns of Ladysmith, Kimberley, and Mafeking. The Transvaal president, Paul Kruger, had believed that war was inevitable and that his people's independence was gravely threatened by Britain's imperial ambitions for the region. In the last decade of the 19th century, gold mining had transformed the Transvaal from one of the poorest to one of the richest countries in the world, upsetting the balance of power and undermining Britain's hitherto undisputed dominance in the area. Gold also enabled the Boers to arm themselves with the most modern European weapons, enhancing their traditional marksmanship to an astonishing accuracy. In the first months of their war, the Boers had inflicted a series of crushing reverses on the British. But their natural caution had prevented them from following up these victories and overrunning large areas of the Cape. The new century found them holding essentially defensive positions on the frontiers of their own lands. Time, however, was not on their side. For months, British troops had been disembarking in the Cape ports in ever-increasing numbers. In December, General Buller had been replaced as Commander-in-Chief of Britain's forces in the region by Field Marshal Roberts. Roberts' appointment signalled, if anything, a hardening of resolve. Roberts arrived in Cape Town on January the 10th, 1900. Fresh troops were now arriving every day. By the end of the war, there would be almost a quarter of a million British and colonial soldiers in the region. By the beginning of February, there were 50,000 in the Southern Cape alone. It was this army that Roberts now led across the Orange River and into the Free State. At Ramdam, Roberts detached a division of cavalry under the command of General John French and sent this force sweeping around the principal Boer forces encamped at Magusfontein. On February the 13th, French seized Pit Drift on the Modder River establishing passage of the river for the following divisions of Robert's main army. On February the 15th, French reached the outskirts of Kimberley, simultaneously dissolving the investment and precipitating a general retreat of the remaining Boer forces between Kimberley and the Modern. Two days later, units of French's cavalry intercepted the main Boer force retreating eastwards along the Modder to Bloemfontein. Almost immediately, units from Robert's main army began arriving from the south, and by noon of the following day, nearly 5,000 Boers were surrounded by 17,000 British infantry supported by artillery. The Boers held out for 10 days, demonstrating remarkable resilience in the face of overwhelming odds and almost ceaseless shelling. Their capitulation on February the 27th brought Britain her first major victory of the war. In Natal, however, Buller's efforts to relieve Ladysmith had met with two further disasters. In mid-January, Buller had seized two bridgeheads across the Tugela after a flank march of some 20 miles.
the operation had been conducted so laboriously and with such a lack of coordination that the Boers had been able to fortify the high ground commanding the north bank of the river. On January the 23rd, Buller launched his offensive against Spion Kop, a precipitous and rocky crag in the center of the range. In the early hours of the following morning, the British stormed over the crest of the hill, routing the Boers and seizing an exposed ridge. For 24 hours, the fighting raged back and forwards. The Boers, holding adjacent peaks, maintained a lethal crossfire on the British positions. The casualties were appalling. Throughout the 24th, the flanks of Spion Cobb teemed with the passage of reinforcements ascending and the stretcher teams bringing down the wounded. Daybreak on the 25th found the summit abandoned. British had withdrawn under cover of darkness. They had suffered nearly 1,500 casualties, more even than they had sustained at Colenso. For two days, the Boer pickets on Spion Kop watched as the caravans and ambulance wagons of Buller's army wound their way back over the plain and across the Tugela towards the waiting field hospitals behind the flanks of Mount Alice. A further effort at Valkrantz in early February produced only a further crop of casualties and another ignominious retreat across the Tugela. For his fourth and final effort to force the river, Buller employed tactics that were, by the standards of the time, quite revolutionary. After seizing the high ground to the east of Colenso by a flank attack, Buller sent his infantry across the river under cover of a rolling artillery screen. Gone was the emphasis on set-piece frontal attacks and on keeping the men in order. Instead, individual units were encouraged to show initiative and stealth and to advance independently and in stages as the opportunities arose. The artillery was now employed for the first time in direct support of the infantry, providing creeping barrages and concentrating on enemy strongpoints and obstacles to the main infantry thrust. There were, of course, mistakes and misunderstandings, but the new tactics proved the key to unlocking the line of hills and ridges blocking the road to Ladysmith. On February the 27th, Buller's army at last emerged from the mountain flanks of the Tugela and began advancing across the empty felt towards Ladysmith. For Buller, the journey from Colenso had been one of the longest and most arduous in his entire career. And he could claim no decisive victory in the field. When their fortifications on the Tugela had been breached, the Boers had melted away to the north. There, in the high passes of northern Natal, they would stand and face Buller again. Five days after Buller reached Ladysmith, Gattaca occupied Stormberg. And on March the 13th, Roberts entered the undefended free state capital of Blermfontein. For the Boers, any hopes of a decisive victory were now beginning to evaporate. Roberts was to remain in Blermfontein for six weeks. Initially, this was seen as a period of consolidation, rest and resupply. The troops were exhausted. 
Their uniforms were tattered and their boots disintegrating on their feet. The cavalry needed new horses and the army in general needed fresh supplies of ammunition and field rations for the troops. Problems of supply had become chronic the further north the army had advanced. Bloemfontein marked the effective limit of the first stage of that advance. And its single track railway link to the Cape provided an increasingly tenuous and congested supply line. The town itself suffered from a congestion that completely overwhelmed both the water supply and the rudimentary sanitation system. A typhoid epidemic swept through the camps clustered on the arid felt around Bloemfontein. By the beginning of April, the epidemic had claimed over a thousand lives and was to rage intermittently for the remainder of the conflict. Of the 20,000 British troops who were to lose their lives in the Boer War, more than half would die of typhoid. The early months of 1900 also saw the first opening shots in the second phase of the war. In February, the Free State leader, Christian de Vett, had seized a convoy of 200 wagons at Vatterval Drift. In March, de Vett had surprised another supply column at Corn Sprut, 20 miles outside Bloemfontein, capturing over 100 wagons, more than 400 prisoners and seven guns. Vett struck again at Reddersburg and at Weppel, taking a further 600 captives before being driven off by relief columns from Robert's main army. Although dismissed at the time as the last desperate actions of a defeated enemy, the raids marked the beginning of the guerrilla war, an increasingly bitter conflict that would persist for a further two years. On May the 17th, Mafeking was at last relieved by flying columns from the north and south. On the 24th, the Free State was formally incorporated as a dependent territory of the British Empire. Two days later, the first units of Robert's colossal army reached the Vaal and began advancing through the Transvaal towards Johannesburg. Five days later, Roberts reached Johannesburg, capturing the gold mines and the deserted commercial capital of the Rand. On June the 5th, Roberts entered Pretoria. He found it, like Johannesburg, largely deserted and undefended. At the end of May, Kruger had abandoned the capital, fleeing with the remnants of his government to the Mozambique frontier. In September, he would sail for Europe, never to return. Throughout the first southern winter of the war, from May through to August, Buller advanced steadily, elbowing his way through the Drakensberg and over the Natal passes. In contrast with his earlier battles on the Tugela, Buller's new methods were a model of economy and effectiveness. At every tortuous twist and turn, he outmaneuvered Bota, conserving his forces and driving the Boers out onto the far less defensible plains of the eastern Transvaal. At the end of August, Buller fought the last set-piece battle of the war. The remnants of Bota's army, still some 7,000 strong, 
that entrenched themselves along a line of hills, ridges and ravines commanding the railway line connecting the Transvaal to the Mozambique frontier and the coast. In the centre of the range, one hill proved the tactical key to Bolter's position. Using the by now well-practiced techniques of tightly coordinated artillery and infantry assaults, Buller seized the hill at minimal cost, thereby collapsing the entire Boer front and precipitating Kruger's subsequent flight into exile. For the next two months, Buller's forces advanced through the eastern Transvaal, chasing a dispirited and disintegrating Boer army from redoubt to redoubt. In a string of engagements among the ravines and escarpments of the northern Drakensberg, Buller's veterans suffered less than a hundred casualties. It was all so very different in the West. Roberts had not defeated the Free State Army or the Boer forces in the Western Transvaal. He had merely swept them aside, believing that the capture of their capitals would compel the Boers to surrender. It was a fatal error of judgment. The Boers were not an urban people and had no European sentimentality for their towns. Even the formal annexation of the Transvaal in October 1900 failed to impress upon them that the war was lost. As the great columns lumbered over the veldt or toiled along the tracks of the railway, they encountered almost no resistance to their passage. In their wake, the Boer commandos struck savagely. Attacking garrisons, snapping up convoys, cutting the rail and telegraph lines, and riding away with as much plunder as they could carry. By now, many of the commandos were equipping themselves with captured British weapons. The perilous and sometimes dilapidated state of Robert's supply lines ensured them a ready supply of ammunition. In a raid on the rail station at Rudeval, De Vett captured so much equipment that after loading his horses and wagons and even his prisoners with booty, he was forced to put to the torch a surplus worth almost half a million pounds. At the end of the year, Buller and Roberts left for London. Roberts to be awarded a peerage and to be appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Army in succession to Wolseley. Buller to be made a scapegoat for the humiliations of the previous year. The new Commander-in-Chief of Britain's forces in the region and the man charged with rounding up the remaining renegades was General Kitchener. Kitchener had earned a reputation in the Sudan for vigorous and determined leadership. He had served as Robert's chief of staff during the long march from Cape Town to Pretoria. He knew the country and the people. Yet it was to take Kitchener a further 18 months to bring the war to an end. Throughout the long South African summer, from November 1900 through to March 1901, the Boer commandos ranged with seeming impunity over the Vet. The Vet in the Free State, now renamed the Orange River Colony, Louis Botha in the Eastern Transvaal, and Cous de la Rey in the mountain ranges of the West. And these were merely the largest groups. There were many more, ranging in size from a couple of dozen to a couple of thousand. Nor were they disorganized. Even the small groups could combine together highly effectively. Individual 
apparently localized actions were often accompanied by a campaign of sabotage over a wide area. Disrupting communications and isolating the garrison or other strategic focus of the attack. In March, an exasperated Kitchener embarked on a strategy of subduing the region area by area. Militarily, this involved massive coordinated drives conducted by thousands of troops. Blockhouses, built originally to protect the railway lines, were augmented and a proliferation of structures sprang up along the tracks. Barbed wire was strung up, telegraph lines laid and rudimentary alarm systems devised and installed. Armoured trains equipped with searchlights steamed up and down the lines. Eventually, the lines became the steel and concrete fibers of a great net in which Kitchener hoped to catch his elusive prey. The policy of house burning, instituted by Roberts as a reprisal for raids on his communications, was now systematically intensified. Under Kitchener, this became the land clearance policy. All the homesteads within a given area of operations were put to the torch, and all livestock, provisions and stores, unless commandeered by the army, were also destroyed. The dispossessed population was transferred to camps situated close to the railway lines. The concentration camps as they came to be called, although intended as internment centers, were also meant to be places of safety and some, albeit Spartan, comfort. And many of the early camps did indeed fulfill these modest intentions. But the sheer numbers swept up off the veldt and into the camps very quickly overwhelmed them. Typhoid and scurvy bore tragic witness to overcrowding, lack of sanitation and malnutrition. But the most distressing and harrowing killers were, as often, the diseases of childhood, fastening themselves on the weak, the undernourished and the helpless. The death toll climbed steadily. In the worst month, October 1901, 3,156 fatalities mainly of children, were recorded. Such figures, representing an annual mean death rate of nearly 35% and an even more alarming 60% for children, fueled an already growing concern in Britain about the cost, purpose and morality of the war. Public attention had first been drawn to the problems and conditions in the camps by Emily Hobhouse, a liberal campaigner and founder of the South African Women and Children Distress Fund. Hobhouse's continuing campaign on behalf of these innocent victims threatened to further undermine public support for the conflict. Redoubled efforts were made to improve conditions and to sort out the ramshackle administration of the system. Gradually, the situation was brought under control and the death toll began to decline. Yet it remains one of the darker chapters in Britain's history. In all, nearly 28,000 Boer civilians died in the camps. Roughly a quarter of all those interned and almost a sixth of the entire Boer population. To add to these troubles, Kitchener was little nearer, after a year, to subduing resistance in the region. At first, the drives had appeared moderately successful. 
between March and October 1901, captives had averaged 2,000 a month. Initially, Boer prisoners had been transported from the Cape to the island of St. Helena, a British possession situated off the Atlantic coast of Africa. As numbers grew, Ceylon, and later India and Bermuda, were used to quarter captives. By August 1901, nearly 30,000 prisoners were either in transit or confinement. On the whole, the distant prisoner of war camps were well organized and administered, and comparatively free of the afflictions that had ravaged the concentration camps. The principal scourges that affected almost equally both armies were boredom, homesickness, and the sense that the war might drag on forever. Such a prospect horrified Kitchener. By now, the war was costing Britain two million pounds a week. Kitchener was under pressure either to cut costs or to bring the war to an end. Yet, despite all his efforts and all the expense of his complicated strategies, the end still appeared a distant prospect. Indeed, it was becoming clear that many of the groups caught between the columns and the railway lines were composed of the old, the sick and the disheartened. Somehow, the leaders and the fittest and most determined bands always managed to slip the net. Who were these elusive, almost invisible men? Their leaders, like Boter or De Vette, were often men of vision and ability. The men themselves, seasoned veterans, resolute and inured to hardships, were mainly farmers or the sons of farmers. They were men with a deep sense of family, religion and community, the descendants of European Calvinist dissenters who had come to Africa in search of freedom. They were not professional soldiers. Indeed, they were hard men to discipline. And the lack of formal structures of command and the reliance of the Boer commanders on persuasion contrasted markedly with the rigid discipline of the British army. But when they did fight, after the tactics had been agreed and the objectives clarified, they fought with a personal commitment that quite outweighed any perceived lack of professional polish. Those that now remained had made that commitment long ago. They were the bitter enders, men pledged to fight to the very end, to the last bullet. Throughout 1901, the raids continued. In September, a light, fast commando under Jan Smuts crossed over the Orange River and invaded the Cape, wiping out a squadron of lancers trying to bar its path. In the same month, Bota pounced on a battalion of mounted infantry on the Transvaal Natal frontier, and after cutting up the battalion, stripped the survivors and sent them naked back to their own lines. It was a humiliation that was becoming all too common. In the type of war in which the Boers were now engaged, there was simply no room for prisoners. The only realistic alternative to letting them go was to kill them. And although there were atrocities, not many but some, and no end of complaints about the other side's behavior, the killing of prisoners was comparatively rare. Indeed, for the Boers, it would have been largely pointless. The British Empire was vast, and the number of troops that could be raised and trained and sent to Africa was almost limitless. Earlier expectations of igniting a rebellion amongst the Cape Dutch-speaking population proved baseless, and hopes of undermining Britain's resolve 
looked increasingly precarious in the face of Kitchener's grim determination. The great drives were working. Not well, but sufficient. Every month found a few more bitter enders caught in the net. And for the Boers, the reservoir was nearly empty. The second winter of the war had been exceptionally severe. Horses and men had suffered terribly. Under Kitchener, the land had become barren and desolate and the supply lines all but impregnable. For the Boers, in their mountain fastnesses or riding like fugitives over the veldt, a third winter beckoned the prospect of a slow capitulation to hunger and exposure. Other considerations also intervened. Emily Hobhouse's campaign had been effective and had put a stop to any further internment, ironically just when the camps were being restored to an acceptable standard and just when they were most needed. The land clearance policy, the house burnings and the cruel program of desertification remained largely unaffected. Only now, at the onset of the third winter, those rendered destitute had nowhere to go. There were also ominous stirrings amongst the native population. As part of a policy of containment, many of the African frontier tribes had been armed by the British, ostensibly for the purposes of self-defense and for the defense of their own areas there were old scores still to be settled. In early May 1902, Zulu Impis settled one long-running dispute by attacking and wiping out a well-armed Boer commando operating in the eastern Transvaal. As the skies darkened and the autumn rains turned once more to sleet, the bitter enders must have looked out from their icy fastnesses and seen on one side these dangerous stirrings on their frontiers and on the other their women and children wandering destitute and defenseless on the veldt. And they must have known that at last the bitter end had come. The remaining weeks of May 1902 were largely spent in hammering out the final terms of the surrender. There were disagreements and disunity on both sides. Amongst the Boers, there were those like De Vett, who had set their hearts on a grim and defiant end, and who now set their faces against any talk of surrender. But there were others like Bota and Smuts, for whom a peace, even an ignominious one, represented the last remaining opportunity to rescue anything from the war. There were differences too between Kitchener and Milner, and these were further complicated by growing pressures from the Rand. Gold production had grown steadily in the previous year, but it still remained less than 40% of pre-war levels. Milner needed peace to restore stability and production to the Rand. But it had to be a peace that guaranteed Britain's interests in the region. Kitchener wanted peace at almost any price. The last 18 months had been a personal nightmare. In the autumn of the previous year, he had tried unsuccessfully to reach a settlement with the Boers, and in October, he had seen the culmination of the campaign against Buller, resulting in Buller's dismissal from the army. He feared that his might well be the next head for the chop. Any workable compromise acceptable to Milner could be assured of Kitchener's blessing. The final terms were agreed on the 31st of May, 
and the formal surrender was signed that night in Kitchener's headquarters in Pretoria. For the number of men involved, the war had been the most expensive Britain had ever fought. Nearly half a million British and colonial troops had seen service in Southern Africa. In purely financial terms, the war had cost more than 200 million pounds. In the first few weeks of peace, the remaining commandos rode in off the veldt to surrender their weapons and to take the oath of allegiance to the new government. Many had lost far more than their independence. Often the farms they returned to had been burned to the ground, their livestock slaughtered and their families diminished through hunger and disease. There was bitterness towards Britain and towards English-speaking people in general. And there were deep divides within Boer society itself. In the latter phase of the war, many Boers, out of need or self-interest, had taken service under the British flag. Mostly, these men had performed only auxiliary duties, but their service had earned them the hatred of their fellows and ensured that the war left more than merely physical scars on the region. Reconstruction was the key to Milner's strategy for peace, and his first priority was to restore the RAND to full productivity. The gold mines, he believed, would provide the finance for sustained economic development, consolidating Britain's military victory through the political benefits of growing prosperity. Reconstruction for the Boers was, if anything, an even more urgent requirement. And in 1902, Boter, De La Rey, and De Vette came to Britain to raise funds for the task. On their arrival at Southampton, they found none of the animosity that had been prevalent at the outset of the conflict. Indeed, they were treated not as enemies, but as heroes, reflecting, as well as a popular admiration for their exploits, a profound change in public attitudes in Britain. Boter recognized that politically, there was still a great deal at stake, and that the future of his nation depended on the unity of his people. In 1904, Boter and Jan Smuts founded a new political party, dedicated to bridging the divisions in Boer society and appealing to the broadest cross-section of the white South African population. Gradually, the RAND recovered its productivity, achieving pre-war levels of output in 1904. But Milner's strategy proved, in the event, less effective than Boter's. In 1906, the Liberal Party was elected to power in Britain. And the new Prime Minister, Campbell Bannerman, granted self-government to the Transvaal within months of coming to power. In the subsequent election, Louis Boter became Prime Minister of the Transvaal and Jan Smuts, Minister of Education. In 1909, Milner's strategy for the region was again confounded when the Constitutional Convention recommended the unification of the four territories within a single self-governing state. In 1910, Chamberlain's vision of a united South Africa finally came into being. Ironically, two of his most formidable enemies were to serve successively as Prime Minister, Louis Boter and Jan Smuts, aligning their country with Britain through two world wars and more than four decades of peace and cooperation.
kovar man upp till dig. Ja, om man släpps ett vatten i skär. Santa Mac pasi uno si come cacis. Nexik me sac pol mili blare, nex dans me di tani me di falare. 